We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Hey, Presiding Officer, I know the whole Chamber will wish to offer our warm congratulations to Professor Higgs on being awarded the yeah. Nobel Prize for yeah. Physics. Yeah. Later today, I'll be meeting Tim Gregory, the UK president of Canadian company CGI, who are establishing a digital services centre of excellence in Glasgow. This announcement will see the creation of a further 250 high-value jobs in the city and reinforces Scotland as a leading destination for foreign direct investment. John Lamont. Thank you. Last week, the Scottish Government's Fiscal Commission announced that an independent Scotland wouldn't just have one oil fund, we would have two. Yet the First Minister's own civil servants reported in March of last year and again in October that an oil fund wouldn't work unless the First Minister either raises taxes or cuts spending. Which is it and when was he going to tell us? First Minister. Well, uh, uh, actually, John Swinney uh, said it last week when he uh, announced the Fiscal Commission's finding. Uh, well, let, let me quote exactly from Mr Swinney from last week. It has been widely assumed that Scotland would have to run an absolute fiscal surplus before investing in a savings fund, and this was reflected in the Scottish Government's early thinking on the subject. However, the Commission is clear that it would be a compelling case for starting to make early investments in an oil fund while in deficit, so long as it is manageable and debt is on a downward path. Uh, that was uh, reinforced by a letter to the Herald uh, last Saturday. So I, I really think John Lamont should probably read John Swinney's letters to the Herald before asking her questions. John Lamont. Yeah. I actually, I'd expected perhaps an attempt by the First Minister to blind us with signs. Perhaps I should have, perhaps we should have predicted that instead he planned to deafen us with gobbledygook. That did not answer the question I asked. And let's just, for the absence of doubt, here is what it says in the advice he was given last year. And I quote. If the Scottish Government had wished to invest in an oil fund, it would have had to reduce public spending, increase taxation or increase public borrowing. And in reporting of this, the First Minister has said both that events have overtaken this or that the Fiscal Commission report reflects that advice. So can the First Minister now read out where that advice is repeated in the Fiscal Commission report or tell us which events have overtaken it? Once again, just like John Swinney's paper, which doubted the affordability of the state pension and talked of public spending cuts. We know they groaned because they didn't expect other people to know what they were saying in private. But we know this government says one thing in private and another in public. So will the First Minister now come clean with the people of Scotland? Will he be raising taxes or cutting spending to pay for his oil fund? And when was he going to tell us? Let me, First Minister. Let me, let me read that, uh, that incredibly scientific uh, quote from Mr Swinney <laughs> again. <laughs> It has been widely assumed that Scotland would have to run an absolute fiscal surplus before investing in a savings fund, and this has been reflected in the Scottish Government's early thinking on the subject. That is a, a straightforward explanation uh, of uh, the question that Joanne Lamont was asking for. And uh, it's not, I mean, uh, you know, I, know, I don't think that can be described as scientific or gobbled. It's a straightforward suggestion that that was the early thinking. And what the Fiscal Commission uh, pointed out uh, was that the criteria for, for marshalling Scotland's enormous natural resources uh, in terms of investing in the future should be uh, uh, two oil funds, one a stabilisation fund to take advantage of windfall gains, uh, and secondly a long-term savings fund, and set out the criteria by which this should be done. Now, I think that's an entirely sensible thing to do. And I think if we'd had these criteria when these funds and these resources were being mismanaged by the United Kingdom, we'd be in an entirely better place. Now, how do I know this? Well, former Labour Chancellor Dennis Healy, of course, he said there should have been an oil fund. He said we should have invested the money in the things we needed in terms of an oil fund and thought about an oil fund, but it wasn't my responsibility by then. It was all Margaret Thatcher's fault. But even more interesting, perhaps, Alistair Darling, when asked this very question in the Scotsman the 21st of August, asked about whether there should have been an oil fund, he said, 
if we had our time over again, perhaps we should have. So even Alistair Darling wants to have his time over again. Well, Scotland has the opportunity over the next 40 years, and we're not going to make the same mistakes as the past. Do you want Lawrence? <laughs> well, perhaps Order. if it wasn't my party, they walked through the lobbies to create a Tory Sorry. government, Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> I know they don't like to remember their own history. That is what the SNP did to Scotland, and Scotland will never forgive them. For all that chuckling nonsense that the First Minister mentioned there, he ignores the central question. Because the one thing the Fresco report does make clear is that the oil fund isn't a savings scheme, it's an insurance policy against the volatility of oil. Although it does rather sound although it does rather sound like the kind of oil fund Order. Get, the noisier they get, the more troubled they are. It does rather sound like the kind of oil fund where you get a free Parker pen just for inquiring. The fact of the matter is the First Minister the First Minister doesn't want to admit that his oil fund won't work without tax rises or spending cuts. He doesn't want to admit that he's been told that rather than set up a Norwegian-style oil fund, Scots would be better off investing in the United Kingdom bonds. And this is why it's serious, because there is a central deceit in what the First Minister says, that the people of Scotland, upon independence, are immediately expecting increased spending on services while his own independent advice says that precisely because of independence he would need to redirect monies from public expenditure to a stabilisation fund. So let's have an answer. Does the First Minister want tax rises to pay for his oil fund or cuts in hospitals and schools and when was he going to tell us? Yeah. Well. Let, let, First let, Minister. Let, let's start with the, the trip down uh, memory lane. Uh, First actually, Minister. James Callaghan in his uh, autobiography, Time and Chance, allocated responsibility to the fall of his government to Labour Party anti-devolutionists. Yeah. Now, I'm surprised that Joanne Lamont doesn't remember that, because she was a Labour Party <laughs> anti-devolutionist uh, at the time. And I, I, I really do think you know, that historical script had to be changed. John Lambert, if we come right up to the present day, Order. is in alliance with the Conservative exactly. Party yeah. in, in a campaign called Better uh, Together. Now, in terms of the, uh, uh, the questions on the, uh, the, the oil fund, these matters were, of course, addressed in the Fiscal Commission report. For example, in terms of the, the, the bond deals against, uh, uh, against returns from an oil fund, that was in page 61. Uh, as an illustration, over the past five years, yields on a 10-year UK government bonds have averaged 3.1 per cent, but the Norwegian oil fund has achieved average annual returns of 5.9 per cent. 5.9 per cent is greater than 3.1 per cent. That is the point, I think, uh, that Joanne Lamont was, was trying, trying to take. Uh, and in terms of the, the stabilisation fund, the, this is a, the, the concept brought forward is a very important one indeed. I mean, what it's suggesting, and if you take, for example, the, the Scottish Government's forecast of $113 uh, oil over the uh, 2017 period. Now, what, if, what the Fiscal Commission is pointing out, let, let's say, for example, that we weren't right about that, but debt were right, who are forecasting maybe $130. That would give you a windfall gain that you weren't forecasting and weren't expecting because you're taking a modest view of the future course of, of, of oil prices. And what the Fiscal Commission sensibly pointed out that that would be very sensible to put that into uh, an oil fund so that you have a stabilisation fund, which means if the forecasts go the other way. Now, I, I hardly think that's a matter of great contention. It seems to me a, a very sensible process to put forward. The fundamental difficulty the Unionist parties have with this is quite clear. They want the people of Scotland to believe that having an asset whose estimated wholesale value over the next 40 years is £1.5 trillion is somehow a major encumbrance and disadvantage. It is a huge advantage for the people of Scotland. Would that we'd had it over the last 40 years, we're certainly going to have it over the next 40 years. To our lament. Well, whatever that was, 
It wouldn't give anybody any confidence the First Minister has a clue about what he's talking about. His own fiscal commission says it therefore requires fewer resources to be allocated to current spending or to reducing other taxes than would otherwise be the case. And the First Minister is simply dishonest when he talks about a stabilisation fund. Ms Lamont, Ms Lamont, I think you should withdraw the that. The First Minister is not being accurate when he says the stabilisation fund... Order. However we describe it, the First Minister said the First Minister said the stabilisation fund was about a windfall. The stabilisation fund is to address the volatility of oil over time and his own fiscal commission Order. said so. We know John Swinney told the First Minister the truth about the state of public finances in private and the First Minister wanted it hidden from the public. Now he says in a separate Scotland we would have two oil funds when in private not once but twice he has been told it wouldn't work without having an impact on taxation or public spending. Unless the First Minister is denying that that advice was given to him, he needs to explain why it's no longer relevant. So when was the First Minister going to tell us this? When was he going to tell us his choice to raise taxes or cut public spending? The answer is never. Honesty is not something this government deals in. Ms Lamont. Order. Order, Ms Lamont. I think you should withdraw that. Well, I am astonished. I don't know what word you use to describe somebody saying... I accept, I accept the advice of the presiding officer, but I have to say, I do not know what word you use to describe a government that says one thing in private and something different in public. The fact of the matter is, Scotland is on pause and we will not be given the full facts with this government ahead of a referendum. First Minister. Uh, you might, uh, I think you might have just been better to withdraw the comment and trying to talk, uh, talk your way around it. But you asked a precise question, so page four of the Fiscal Commission proposal, and I assure them this is not too scientific and it's not too complicated, so we'll just read it out. We have, however, this is in page four of the Fiscal Commission proposal. We have, however, proposed a model which takes into consideration the fiscal position that an independent Scotland is likely to inherit, which in principle allows investments to be made both into a stabilisation fund and a savings fund without an automatic offsetting change to public spending and taxation. That is page four of the Fiscal Commission report. And I think uh, it reflects exactly the question that Joanne Lamont had to ask me if indeed there was a question in there uh, somewhere. So that's what the Fiscal Commission said, and that was said last week. John Swinney uh, just wrote to the papers to, to point out the importance of the Fiscal Commission's uh, recommendations. I, I do think that, I mean, this is an issue which we know that uh, Alistair Darling, if he had his time over again, and, and Dennis Healy would like to have done something in terms of investing for the future. We have got a Fiscal Commission report which sets out clear criteria how we can marshal Scotland's resources yeah. and make sure that asset is used for the benefit of this generation and for future generations. Nobody seriously would argue uh, that the UK has handled oil well as a resource over the last 40 years. Nobody would seriously dispute that Norway, the country across the North Sea, has handled that resource much better. The Fiscal Commission have put forward a proposal which allows Scotland to get towards the fortunate position of Norway as opposed to making the unremitting bungles of Westminster and successive United Kingdom yeah. chancellors. Question number two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, I saw him yesterday, but uh, other than that, no plans near future. Ms Davidson. Well, Presiding Officer, I'm not sure we got terribly far there, so let's try this again from the beginning. The Scottish Government is quoted in the press this morning saying that the secret government oil papers from last year, and I quote, have been overtaken by the expert reports of the Fiscal Commission Working Group. 
So can the First Minister confirm that in this case, the term overtaken actually means they've just lifted the good bits and thrown away the bad bits that don't suit his separatist agenda? Oh. <laughs> First Minister. The, the, the Fiscal Commission is part of the Council of Economic Advisers. The Council of Economic Advisers includes two Nobel laureates uh, in economic. It has a, a range of economic expertise on it. Nobody would seriously dispute uh, it has very, very substantial uh, economic firepower. We published the report. John Swinney pointed out in a, a letter to the papers how uh, that uh, was different from our early thinking in the matter. Surely the whole point of, of having a fiscal commission of such prestige and authority it is to take the advice they put forward and offer, and that's exactly what we've done. Uh, and I think, uh, again, in fairness, Ruth Davidson should acknowledge that the work that was published is a very substantial piece of work which sets out clear criteria about how we can handle and manage this amazing natural resource off the shores of Scotland and do so in an extremely effective manner. Ms Davidson. That's all very, very interesting, but maybe the First Minister would be interested to know... Maybe the First Minister would be interested to know that this morning I ran this government report and the Independent Fiscal Commission report through university cheating software. Uh, and what did I find? Whole sections cut and pasted. Entire paragraphs on Scotland's projected net fiscal debt, on the country's debt interest payments and on notional borrowing costs. All the good stuff made the grade, all the bad stuff hit the bin. <laughs> It's the Alistair Campbell School of dodgy dossier writing. It seems when the government reached any section in here, and there were plenty, Order. that said that an oil fund would mean higher taxes, more borrowing, or lower public spending, they simply hit delete. <laughs> it's another case of Alex Salmon's say anything, do anything, promise anything approach to independence. Isn't it the case? Isn't it the case that this First Minister has no wish to be straight with the people of Scotland, but would rather try and hoodwink them into a yes vote with spun lines, half-truths and incomplete analysis? First Minister. The, the, the Fiscal Commission had available to, to research that had been done by the, the Civil Service, uh, and therefore in common, in common, in well, in common to, to both reports, in common to both reports, is the analysis of what would have happened over the last 40 years if Scotland had control of its own resources. And comment to both reports, and Ruth Davis is correct here, it points out that the existing fiscal position of Scotland under that position would have been instead of having a share of the voluminous national debt run up by the Conservative and Labour parties, Scotland would have assets of something approaching £100,000 million. And there is no disagreement in terms of the two reports between that, and that's an analysis of the past. And what's interesting, of course, and I think that's now accepted and given, even Alistair Darling thought it would be a good idea to have an oil fund, is that over these last 40 years, unionist politicians were telling us what a bad idea it would be yeah. if we controlled uh, our own natural resources. So I, I, I think Ruth Davidson should look seriously at the Fiscal Commission proposal and see how it's going. I have to say I'm, Order. I'm interested and surprised by Ruth Davidson wanting to go on to these things because they were actually part of a fascinating analysis on, on Ruth Davidson's ability to count by Peter Jones. Uh, someone, incidentally, a well-respected commentator, nobody Order. would suggest he was a card-carrying member of the Scottish uh, National Party, but he was looking at the claim that oil decommissioning was part of a 30 or billion or more black hole suggested by Ruth Davidson uh, uh, and Better uh, together. Uh, what did Peter Jones said? Is this an example of her ability to add up numbers? She should never be able to look at a government office, still get inside it. <laughs> the Better Together paper confused annual one-off spending, one year sums, to totals that don't occur for another 47 years, and it did some asinine double counting. In short, it added two and two and made 44. <laughs> it is complete. Nonsense. Now, if a respected commentator, not suspected as a, a member of the SNP, says this, uh, and I have to say in terms that I would never use uh, about, <laughs> about Ruth Davidson, then I've really got to question it. Anyway, it did end with a, a, a great lesson. Being time better together, that this nonsense 
commits the cardinal political sin insulting the intelligence of the voters, perhaps better together, should stop yes. insulting the intelligence of Scotland, yes. telling us that oil of massive quantities and massive wealth is a liability to Scotland <laughs> while they try to hang on to it for Westminster. Question number three, Rhoda Grant. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government plans to implement a wage rise for NHS workers in Scotland. First Minister. Uh, I think the announcement last week from Jeremy Hunt that he planned to block the pay rise to NHS staff for 2014-15 is nothing short of bad faith. To try and steal the pay rise back from workers' hands risks destabilising the NHS across the UK and damaging morale. And therefore, the Scottish Government has no intention of following Jeremy Hunt and will use Scotland's independence from Westminster of the health service to block this move. However, I have to say that as long as our budget remains tied to Westminster, that UK government's damaging approach could further drive down Scotland's budget in the future. I thank the First Minister for that response. However, the First Minister has sanctioned a pay rise of up to 4% for the top managers in the NHS. Can nurses in the NHS in Scotland expect a pay rise of the same degree? First Minister. Well, I, I, I think they, that they should examine the, the reality behind that. I mean, what has happened, for example? Well, I, I think it's very important. We take, for example, the pay increase of 1% uh, for 13, 14 affected from 1st of April this year. We made additional payments to low paid staff to ensure that everyone earning below 21,000 received an increase of 250,000. And for senior managers, uh, that was capped at 80,000. That is what we've done in terms of equity within the pay scales of the, the health service, and that's been strongly supported by the health service unions. But, you know, Rhoda Grant uh, should reflect on the fact that we are able uh, to say that we are not going to go down the direction of Jeremy Hunt because Scotland has independence of thought and action on the health service, albeit that we may be constrained by the future finances, uh, be dragged down by the Barnett, Barnett Forum. And I'm very worried about this because Andy Burnham, Labour Secretary of State for Health, speaking last week, says he was talking passionately uh, about getting English MPs back up the road and saying that he was going to speak to Richard Simpson and Rhoda Grant and others. Let's get health policies that can be consistent across England, Scotland and Wales. Wouldn't that be a good thing, pulling in the same direction as opposed to pulling our separate ways? I doubt if there's a health worker in Scotland who's not glad that we have autonomy over the health service and can avoid having the breach of faith imposed by a Westminster government. Question number four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of the Specialist Crime Division's responsibilities for organised crime, counter-terrorism and intelligence, what its role will be in relation to the National Crime Agency, which sets the UK's overall operational agenda for tackling these matters? First Minister. Well, uh, Police Scotland's Specialist Crime Division has wide-ranging national responsibilities and work closely with the local police divisions. I expect it to work closely with the, the National Crime Agency. The National Crime Agency can only conduct operational activity in Scotland if authorised by the Lord Advocate, and any activity within Scotland would be in support of Police Scotland operations to tackle serious and organised crime. Now, Police Scotland will work closely with the NCA to make best use of resources to complement and support our operational activity to tackle criminality as it affects Scottish communities. Christian uh, Graham. I thank the First Minister for his answer. Uh, I thank him for his reply, from which I take some comfort that the operational independence of Police Scotland through the Specialist Crime Division is not compromised. But in the light of the referendum next year, have there been discussions about the relationship between the rest of the UK and Scotland post independence in combating, for example, international terrorism? First Minister. Well, the, the, the Deputy First Minister uh, reflected these points at the Foreign Affairs Committee on the 28th of January this year. She said, in terms of security intelligence, I would envisage Scotland having an independent domestic intelligence machinery in Scotland, sitting alongside our police service, but working very closely, given our sharing an island with the rest of the United Kingdom. Now, we are keen, as a government, to discuss what a future post-independence relationship with the UK government would look like, but as yet, UK ministers are not willing to engage with us on this and many other subjects. William Smith. Thank you. Can I ask the First Minister what progress has been made with the Scottish Crime Camp has been built in my constituency since it's a key part of the Scottish Government's strategy to tackle or, uh, serious organised crime? When is it due to open and how many jobs will it bring? 
First Minister. Well, I expect uh, the Garkosh Crime Campus to be operational early next year, and I'm pleased to say that it's on time uh, and on budget. Once complete, it will be for each partner located to recruit any staff that need, or many staff will be moving from existing locations. Uh, I think it's worth noting the project has provided employment for 350 contractors. The work currently underway is supporting 43 apprentices, including six brand new uh, apprentices, and I'm sure the whole chamber welcomes that. Question number five, Keza Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the findings of the Economic and Social Research Council regarding higher education. First Minister. Since we, we took office in 2007, the percentage of 18 year olds at university from the most disadvantaged backgrounds has increased from 8.1% that we inherited from Labour to 13% for the 2013 14 academic year. Now, that is progress. But as the findings of the Economic and Social Research Council show, much more needs to be done. Now, that's why we brought forward the post-16 bill passed in June that gives a widening access to the force of law uh, with university in Scotland required to bring more students from poorer backgrounds through that university experience. It's why also we're providing £10 million of support for 2089 additional funded places at universities in 2013-14, 727 for widening access, 1,020 are for students coming from college, 342 places are for sectors likely to have the greatest academic impact. President officer, the report clearly says the abolition of the graduate endowment in Scotland has not led to increased representation of students from more socially deprived backgrounds. This is the First Minister who has presided over the worst student support packages, the worst widening access records, Order. and the highest dropout rates on these aisles. If he truly believes that education in Scotland is based on the ability to learn and not the ability to pay, why can't poor kids get into his universities? First Minister. I think Kesa Dugdale, it's her party, the one that she supports, who wants to reimpose tuition, fee. tuition fees <laughs> on the students uh, of Scotland. And it's this party, and I've accepted that progress isn't fast enough, which is why we're proposing further, uh, further measures. But from 8.1% to 13% over our term of office, that at least is a right move forward. And perhaps she should have some thinking, I know it's not her personal responsibility, of how her colleagues sitting on the front bench there could have allowed the figure to fall so low as 8% in 2007. Now, part of our measures is, of course, the post-16 bill. Uh, and I've explained how we believe that will yeah. be instrumental uh, in widening access. But if memory serves me correct, the Labour Party voted against yeah, uh, that measure. So what's the point for Keza Dugdale in coming to ask a question, having voted against one of the measures which we hope will improve that situation? And just as a, a, a warning, uh, in terms of what happens when you impose tuition fees, as we know, and we should be celebrating, the number of Scots accepted to Scottish universities for 2013-14 has risen to a record 27,990 students, an increase of 2 per cent compared to this stage uh, last year. Now, in England this year, there was a, a slight increase of students under the fees situation going to university, but there remain almost 20,000 students below the pre-fee level, 20,000 less than there was before the imposition of the £9,000 tuition fees. Now, does Tessa Dugdale actually believe that these, among these 20,000 students, the ones who are not longer going to university in England, does she really believe that's the well-off students who are not going to university? Believe me, it's the people from disadvantaged backgrounds who are being excluded from university in England, the very people, the very measures that Kezi Dugdale and her party would like to impose on the Scottish people. Question number six, Will Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the organisers of the 2014 Commonwealth Games regarding ticket allocations. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government is working closely with the Glasgow 2014 Organising Committee. As the committee has developed a ticket allocation policy. I am delighted that these are and can claim to be the most affordable Commonwealth Games ever. The first uh, to offer half price concessions for children under 16 and indeed the over 60s. And the demand for, for tickets, as Liz Smith will know, has been absolutely fantastic, with over 2.3 million requests uh, for around 1 million tickets. Liz Smith. Uh, I thank the First Minister for that reply. And yes, it is good news about the uh, size of the demand. During the London Olympics and Paralympics, 125,000 tickets were made available for young people to see uh, different sports events completely free. 
And judging by today's excitement, as the Queen's Baton route in Scotland has been unveiled, a large number of uh, Scottish youngsters would greatly appreciate the same opportunity for the Commonwealth Games. Is it the First Minister's understanding that such opportunity will be provided by the Games organisers and it will include allocations for some of Scotland's most vulnerable children? First Minister. The uh, latest measures to ensure that happens will be announced very shortly by the, the Games organisers. But I hope that Liz Smith will agree uh, that the announcements made to date have taken account not, not just of where the London Olympics had successes, but, but also where there were some early failures in terms of the attendance at certain venues. And the, the process of affordability and ticket allocation has taken that into account so as we can learn the lessons and hopefully do things even better. But uh, uh, Liz Smith is quite right to, to raise this issue and assure you that this is a matter which is being addressed by the Games organisers. And as they roll out their announcements, uh, she'll see, I, I believe, that some of her hopes are, are, are realised. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to Member's business. Members who are not participating in the debate should leave quickly and quietly. Order. Could I ask guests in the public gallery to leave the chamber quietly, please? This parliament is still in session. We'll now move on to the next item of business today, which is uh, a member's business debate on motion number 7862 in the name of Jim Hume on CAB run innovative youth outreach projects. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members.